Can the U.S. remain the star of the global chip industry? Welcome to the call. I'm Jay Sapsford. Semiconductors power modern life. You'll find them in everything from phones to laptops, from cars to leaf blowers. And yet securing this man-made commodity is complicated. Geopolitical rivalries are testing the intricate web of global chip suppliers. Here in the U.S., we dominate a crucial part of that supply chain, but we have a shortage of engineers. We regulate too much, and sometimes we find ourselves short of the water, copper, or importantly, energy needed to fuel production. So let's cut to the question of the moment. Can the U.S. maintain its edge in chips? Joining us now is John Newfer, President and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association. John, welcome to the call. Thanks, Jay. Uh, really glad to be here, and the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> John, here's your opening prompt. Can a country, any country, be an economic military world power without being a major player in the chip industry? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, the, the chip industry is just so incredibly foundational to kind of everything in, in our innovation economy, digital economy. Um, uh, right now, the U.S. <clears throat> uh, has captured about 50% of the global market share, and it's been that way for uh, many decades. Um, for jobs, we provide about 400,000 jobs, but 2 million indirect jobs. That's on the kind of the, the straight economic side, but a national security without our chips, we don't have the, the, the war fighter capabilities that we have. Um, and things like um, cutting edge stuff like AI without semiconductors, we don't have AI. So unless there's like raging innovation when it comes to semiconductors, we, we don't have these kind of breath, we don't have this breathtaking progress that we've been, been able to make in AI. And frankly, uh, that's why we are the world leader in artificial intelligence. And yet it's far, hard to find an industry that is more global, more interdependent. Is there any single country out there that makes an entire advanced chip from soup to nuts, from beginning to end? Uh, there's two secrets to our um, great success in the semiconductor industry. One is we plow a ton of our sales back into R&D, about 20% in the U.S. back into R&D. But the other thing is we've, we've been able to leverage the global supply chains. Um, any single country aspiring to have the soup to nuts end to end semiconductor supply chain within its borders uh, would be uh, undertaking some serious folly. Uh, it would be prohibitively expensive to do that, and it would ensure that innovation in, in that country would be seriously, seriously diminished. So we very much rely on these supply chains to, to innovate and, and stay ahead. Okay, one of our members is asking, she's worded this brilliantly, how do you reshore then and build resilience without causing fragmentation of that global supply chain that you mentioned is so important? Yeah, because we don't, we, when we when we talk about reshoring, it's not really reshoring. It's where are you going to put the the, the new fabs that, that you don't when you build a fab, you don't move things around. The, the sunk costs are much too much. So we always talk about bringing some of the some of the capacity back, like a minimum viable capacity back. You know, in the 1990s, we accounted for about 37 percent of global manufacturing of chips. That got down to about 10%. Now with all these manufacturing uh, uh, incentives going in place, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an investment tax credit, there's the grants. With all this stuff going into place, we've kind of turned the corner and are coming back up. 10% uh, is way too little. So we're trying to bring more of the manufacturing back, but not all of it. So we're not, not fragmenting anything. There's actually two things that have to happen here. One is we have to have more manufacturing in the U.S., but we also have to make sure that the supply chains that exist within our uh, uh, economies of our friends and allies, that those are resilient and strong. And so th those two things have to happen simultaneously for, for us to be as, as, as competitive and innovative as possible. Now, John, I'm throwing up a chart here that really shows why we all should be caring about chips. We see semiconductors not only in tech gadgets, but across the whole economy, from cars to kitchen appliances. So this $600 billion industry is no longer just about tech, but as you were saying, it's crucial to, to everything we do. And given the industry's importance, it's understandable that policymakers would want to reshore at least some of the crucial parts of this production. So how's the reshoring going, That at least the, the portion that we're doing, and where is it headed? 
So I'd like to say um, we're off to a great start when it comes to reshoring. You know, when we when we lived through the pandemic and we found that all it took was one or two chips that cost a nickel or a dime to, to keep a car off the sales lot, we all kind of understood. Uh, actually, these semiconductors are pretty, pretty important. Actually, in Washington, when I showed up in this job 10 years ago, nobody knew what a semiconductor was. And now I like to say there's a lot of people in Washington that think they know what a semiconductor is. But but so so um um so we we have to really um sorry can, can you jay can you go back and ask the question again well i'm just wondering uh, you know where where is this headed i mean you said we were off to a great start so I'm just yeah wondering. right so right so exactly okay so um right now um our industry has committed uh over 600 billion dollars uh for investment in the us and much of that is already happening there's huge fabs going in, in new fabs going in in Texas and, and in Arizona uh, to the tune of $630 billion altogether. That's projects in 28 states um, and going to add about a half of uh, 500,000 uh, jobs to the U.S. economy. And uh, it will triple our manufacturing capacity by 2032, the fastest uh, rate of growth increase of any other country in the world. Do we have enough energy to fuel all of that? I mean, the energy requirements of these fabs is enormous, right? Right now, no. Um, but I, I will say there's a lot of effort in the states and the federal government to think about how to how to deal with this. It's not just it's not just the fabs. It's really more kind of the AI da data centers. Mm -hmm. The thing that we look at very closely is how can we make our chips more energy efficient. So every year we do that by about twofold. Every year we increase our, our chip efficiency by about two times. The problem is, is the performance uh, uh, increases and the demand for AI is even faster than that. So this is a big challenge for us, Jay. I, I, I'm confident we'll get in front of it, but right now it presents itself as a challenge. That's There's going there. to be other resource constraints too, if my understanding is correct. We're going to have, you know, we're going to have talent. We have shortages of water, depending on where the fabs are, or uh, even copper, basic critical minerals and things like yeah. that. Are yeah. there moves underway to address all of these? Yeah, so um, our cutting edge fabs reuse about 90% of, of the water once it's, uh, once it's um, in the system. That's on the cutting edge. We still need we need to improve there on the critical mineral side. No doubt about it. Um, that that that's that's a major challenge. Um, the, the good news is we're not the only ones out there facing this challenge. So we have a lot of uh, allies in industry that are working to to diversify our um, our sources. What this does say, Jay, is that. We need to make sure that our relations with our friends and allies around the world are strong so that we can draw on them as well to help us uh, meet this challenge. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because here's a chart that I found quite surprising. We're not looking at sales here. We're looking at which countries add the most value to the global supply chain. And of course, the more value you add, the more profits you make. We hear a lot of discussion about China, but when measured this way, frankly, the U.S.'s value add is six times that of China. And that raises a series of questions to me. Are the China hawks right to see the Chinese chip manufacturing as a competitive threat? So the China Hawks are right and they're wrong. Uh, to explain that chart a little bit, the, the, the reason why we're so have such a big piece of the of the pie, or the big piece of the, the silicone wafer there, right. um, is that um, we are far ahead in design capabilities. Our manufacturing has fallen off; it's coming back. But where we're very muscular is is in design. In terms of kind of the the so-called China challenge. You know, for the very high-end chips, China has a, a long way to go. But for the so-called legacy chips, the chips below, it's an arbitrary uh, threshold, 28 nanometers, um, above 28 nanometers, China is making a lot of progress. And by our estimate, uh, by 2027, we'll have roughly 40% of global capacity for these so-called legacy chips. So it's a mixed bag when it comes to China challenge, 
but um, I don't think we uh, we should in any way uh, underestimate that challenge. You know, uh, we've uh, been uh, trying to uh, restrict some of the very high end trips from going to China through export controls like that. And one of our members is asking an interesting question here. Some see export controls as a way to keep sensitive technology out of China's hands. Others say that it's just incentivizes China to develop its own chips and we should supply China with all varieties of chips to keep them globally integrated. Where does Mr. Neufer come down on that question? Somewhere in the middle of all of that, Jay. <laughs> um, my view is uh, it's up to the US government to figure out uh, what, what sensitive technologies stay out of Chinese hands and whatever the US government uh, decides we, we work with them on. Um, I, I, I do also uh, believe that us, being integrated into the Chinese economy as an industry it is important. It helps us with our, our connectivity and um, as, as economies and as nations. And I think that should not be underestimated. Another uh, member is asking, how are tariffs likely to uh, affect uh, the global supply chain? For, for the semiconductors, the um, I think the big thing that we talk about um, repeatedly is that as the administration is thinking about tariffs, please recognize that um, we, we, we can't have the entire global supply chain here. It would be prohibitively expensive and really retard our ability to innovate. So um, we, need to, we need to rely on inputs from overseas, both to build the fabs, the fabrication facilities, and and to run them. So as tariffs are being put in place, and we, you know they're coming, we've asked the administration to to keep in mind that isn't the ask the question isn't the kind of overarching objective of reindustrializing America the first order objective here, and um, uh, let's let's try to limit these tariffs so that these key input in, uh, inputs don't make it prohibitively expensive for us to manufacture here in the US, uh, both to build the fabs and, and to run the fabs. Now on those imports, another member is asking, what do you expect on the ongoing 232 and 301 investigations on the industry? And when can we expect to hear about those results and forthcoming actions? Now these are both designed to address unfair trading practices or harms to national security, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, I'll say two things. One, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna guess crystal ball when, when these, these tariffs may be coming. Um, but I, I I will say I'm I'm we're expecting to get some 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 level of tariffs uh, for semiconductors. I, I I do I do think that that is coming. And China makes a lot of commodity chips, but it also imports a lot of chips. My understanding is China imports more semiconductors than it does oil at this point. Uh, what does that say about about uh, their uh, competitive positioning? Yeah, so a couple of things there. Um, China up about 30 percent of chips produced in the world uh now keep in mind that about half of those chips that go into china are kicked right back out in goods manufactured there so so it's a little bit deceptive the other half half is is, is absorbed by the economy and just yeah you know, just to clarify something here you know in terms of exposure to the chinese economy as as a market it, it's very significant for uh, our our industry but uh, our um, leadership decided a long time ago not to build fabs in China. So we have almost no fabrication capacity in, in, in the Chinese uh, market. So another member is asking, uh, the US government is pushing to reshore some of the manufacturing capacity here in the United States, but we also see some US companies consolidating their production uh, in Asia. How do those two square? Is this just part yeah, of the global dance? Yeah, it's just not, it's, it's, so like I said, a, most of our companies have, have been um, doubling down with their investments in the US. But it's not just been in, in, in Asia in terms of other, other investments, it's also, also been in Europe. Our, our industry needs to be uh, around the world in the global markets. Um, a huge focus has been on the U.S. market in the last few years, but there's there's been activity in Europe and Southeast Asia and East Asia as well. Now, the one thing to, to keep in mind is coming off the pandemic, we all understood that not just for semiconductors, but for some critical supply changes, over concentrations of, of, of production. 
And one of the things we're trying to do right now, and we are effectively doing, is 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 reducing that those over concentrations by building more capacity here in the U.S., building more capacity in Europe and Southeast Asia, so that we're spreading the peanut butter over a broader piece of territory, which helps us uh, deal with um, global unrest, earthquakes, think, things like that. So what percentage of our high-end chips does the U.S. import, and how long would it take to expand domestic production enough to meet that demand, do you think? So the, the highest, the tippy-top highest end um, is right now all, all made overseas. But there's, we, particularly with the um, fabs opening up um, in Arizona and, and, and Texas, I don't have the number, but we're going to have a very significant increase in the number of of uh, high high end chips produced here in the U.S. That that that's been one of the one of the big goals of these manufacturing um, incentives, and 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 I think it's it's going to prove to be quite quite successful. I, I also, yeah, I, I will say that you know there's a there's an obsession with the high end chips, and that's important. Uh, they, they go into the you know data centers and and uh, these these GPUs and CPUs. But most of the chips are actually these so-called legacy chips. And um, these are the chips that go in cars, they go in your display monitors, they go into virtually everything with an electric current pulsing through them. And that's an area where we're probably not investing enough here in the US. And I would like to see a, a, a bigger focus. All right, we're galloping home to our conclusion here. So as a takeaway, what are you telling Washington policymakers about what the industry needs to keep its advantage? Well, there's a lot of things. I mean, there's there's everyone is struggling with a, a talent shortage uh, for sure. Uh, and so we, we, we need to, when we educate foreign students here, we need to keep them here to work in our, 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 our companies. Um, but the, the kind of over, overarching message is, well, you know, export controls and tariffs and all these so-called de de defensive measures have, have a place in U.S. policy. Our industry's future and success will be defined more by the affirmative steps put in place to help us pedal faster and stay ahead of everybody else, not the defensive measures. So we we lean in very strongly to the administration and say, while you're working on these other things like export controls and tariffs, please don't lose sight of the fact that we need to have an ecosystem that promotes a breathtaking pace of innovation in our sector. Well, clearly this isn't just about tech policy anymore, it's about the future of national strategy. John, you've been a great sport in taking some of these tough questions. John Newfer, President and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, thank you so much for swinging by today. Thanks, Jay. It was fantastic. Really appreciate it. All right. Our audience has gotten their shot of informational espresso and is ready to tackle the day. Missed a live episode? Catch the replay on our website, LinkedIn, or on YouTube. You can also listen to the call's podcast edition on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to you, our members, for joining us. This has been The Call, brought to you by the Global Intelligence Desk, asking the right questions to navigate uncertain times.